The New Marketing Show is brought to you by Trinity Web Media. Trinity Web Media solves business problems through effective digital marketing. TrinityWebMedia.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The New Marketing Show, the marketing podcast where we talk about how effective marketing solves business problems. As always, I'm joined with my co-host, Kevin Everly. Kevin, how are you today? Great. Doing well. Yourself? Excellent. I am doing fine. Well, today I am super excited to have, we have a special guest on the show, one of my very, very good friends, and don't tell her, but probably one of the smarter people that I know, if not one of the smartest. I don't, oh, shit, I told her. Damn it. Okay, I blew it. Wow. So Susan, so we have Susan Beyer of Audience (laughs) Audit, and her website is audienceaudit.com. And what Susan is, is an audience segmentation specialist. Now that is so niche and so detailed, I'm gonna let her explain exactly what she does. So Susan, can you tell us a little bit about audience audit and what is audience segmentation? Sure, so um, first of all, nice to be here with you guys, Greg, Kevin, awesome. I appreciate the opportunity to be on the show. Um, So audience audit, I started, I don't know, it's like almost 10 years ago now, Greg. Um, my background's in, you know, marketing strategy, which I've been doing for a a horrifyingly long time. Um, but I, but I started audience audit to really solve a a particular problem that I was seeing out in the marketplace, which is, you know, I, I, I like marketers. I've always worked with marketers. Um, but marketers, you know, have a reputation for going off their gut, you know, and, and it can be a pretty well-informed, well-experienced gut. But it's still gut. And especially when you're talking to sort of small to mid-size agencies who don't have maybe the resources of like massive corporations or these big New York agencies or whatever, when it comes to helping clients figure out like what their audiences are and how to build their marketing around them, a lot of times, honestly, kind of peek behind the curtain here, it's basically coming out of six to eight smart people sitting around a conference table and deciding what those audiences look like, like deciding what's important to them and what matters and sort of how we're going to, how we're going to structure our marketing for this particular client. And, um, that's just, you know, and I've been in that room, I've, I've led those discussions, but it's not always the best way to make these decisions. And I think even as marketers, we're sometimes not trained in, in ways to think about audience that I think are fundamental. So it's not necessarily anybody's fault. It's brought up in the system and how we're trained, but, um, but it's not that great. So I started audience audit to help customers really understand what is going on with the audiences that they care about, that they want to work with, that they're working with now, or they want to work with in the future. And audience segmentation research is just a means to that end. Basically, It's a quantitative approach to assessing sort of a universe of people or if you're B2B businesses, whatever that you sell to and finding out within that group sort of what's going on between different populations in there. Because you and I both know like if you you could take any group and not everybody feels the same way about things. And when you're specifically talking about making, um, you know, decision purchases, People look for different stuff. Even if they end up buying the same product, they can be doing it for really different reasons. So audience segmentation is a way to sort of look at that picture and get some insight that can help marketers be relevant when they're talking about what they're doing. So, so when, you, when, you, when you say audience segmentation, are, are you referring to creating customer, like ideal client personas and profiles so that we can go out and speak to them in a manner where they're going to receive the message better and we can hit their, their, maybe their pain points and identify what problems that they have and speak to them in that manner. Yeah. So, so that's where this work leads. I kind of differentiate between audience segments and personas because to me, personas are the next step. Personas are like, this is who we want to sell to and these people, and this is how we understand them. I'm back at the, what does the landscape look like? And it may include audiences that you don't want to sell to, or that frankly are not likely to buy to you, or they don't align with your strategic objectives or, you know, whatever. So 
segments is just what 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 the landscape looks like. Personas are a tool for going after the people that you as an organization feel are a great opportunity for you in terms of what they need, what you do well. Um, so it's sort of that additional, that's additional step. But yeah, so agencies and marketers take the work I do and then from there decide, okay, of, of the landscape that's out there, these are the, these are the personas that are of interest to us. Yeah. Um, so Susan, out of while you're while you're figuring out your segments, uh, you know what are some of the things you're looking at? Whether it be uh, demographics, interest, geo, you know what what do you what do you use to yeah. figure out what that segment consists of? So everybody has a different approach to this because, there, as you can imagine, there's lots of different ways to chop up a population. You know, and and the way we were all taught as marketers. Um, really starts with demographics, you know, so women 25 to 49, you're looking at, you know, whatever. So that's demographic segmentation. That's what a lot of people use because that is the absolute easiest information to get about anybody. You know, you can buy databases, you can easily profile people on Facebook based on their demographics, you know, their gender or their age or you know, those kinds of things. So that information is easy and you, and you can see people on paper and be like, okay, I know what group this person is in, okay? Another way that people go about segmentation is behavioral. So what have you done? Did you click? Did you buy? Did you visit? You know what I mean? Those, those kinds of decisions. And a lot of organizations have that kind of information in their database, even if they don't have demographic information sometimes, right? Especially now that people are buying online Right? You don't always know exactly who that person is, but you know how frequently they've bought or whatever. So you could look at things that way. Um, I don't do either of those. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's just a perspective I have, right? Like, and it's common sense, and it's so funny because I, I don't know why it isn't more prevalent, but decisions based on those things. They don't make a decision because they're a woman or because they're a certain age or whatever. Like vast majority of decisions are made based on something that's happening between the ears that you cannot see on paper. So the segmentation work that I do is attitudinal, which means that we are looking at divvying up an audience based on, right, why are they here in the first place? Like what is the problem they are looking to solve? Um, how do they feel about this whole process? Like, are they super excited and feel confident that they know what they need to know to make this purchase decision? Or do they feel super sketchy and like, I'm gonna get taken advantage of because I don't know enough about this and I need some expert advice. Like all of those things affect not only the decision they make, but where they're getting their information, what kind of information or um, influences are, are, are bearing weight on their decision, um, the kinds of things they want from you if they hire you can be really, really different sort of depending on where their headspace is with respect to all of this. You know, is this, is this decision that they're going to make something they're super excited about or is it basically a pain in the ass that they just have to check off a box? And, and those things matter, you know, in decision making. So that's attitudinal segmentation and that's the work that, that I do. That's the work I believe is best for marketers who are developing content, who are developing messaging and trying to be resonant with a particular audience, that's the stuff we need to know. Cause honestly, nobody wants an email that's like, hello, woman 25 to 49. Like that's not compelling. So you gotta find something else, right? To get people's attention and to resonate with them. So. You, you know, I think that, I think that I might prefer getting a, um, hey, Male, hi, male, uh, 40, 40 to 49 versus hello, first name <laughs> in a bad email. <laughs> right? Well, first name's not a lot better, especially, you know, I mean, the, 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 the real problem is that marketers are making assumptions about people based on these demographics. And I, they are just, if, if you're wrong, which you are going to be with a certain segment of, you have just shot yourself in the foot, you know? Um, because all it, all it does is tell you that you don't care enough to really understand these people beyond something superficial about them. Yeah, and anytime you make a decision best based on gut and instinct alone, I think your instinct and your recommendations that you make to a client 
or a prospective client are always something can be argued in, in in that. You know, this is my experience. This is what I've seen in the past. But using your approach, <laughs> and you actually hit them with, you know, I, and I've seen your work. I know the the, the the deliver. I've seen. I know the deliverable that your clients get. You know, they get a large report full of data. You can't argue with data. Yeah. You can, but you're going to. Well, you can, and, pe- and people do. Um, but certainly, you know, I think it's important to the extent that you are able, right? And you guys have a small business. I've got a small business too, right? So it doesn't mean not everybody out there can drop twenty grand on on doing research, right? But if you can, the insight will help you. It's going to get you closer to the bullseye when you're doing messaging and stuff like that, and it's going to keep you out of the weeds. Right, because it's going to help you understand what matters to people and what doesn't, and you stop wasting your time and your money talking about stuff that's not helping you, or may actually be hurting you. You know, sometimes we we find things that brands are saying that for certain segments, like that's bad. Don't say that. They don't. That's not helping you. That's working in the wrong direction. So, so. I, you know, I love that, Susan. And I do have a question, but before I do, I do want to comment on the gut. You know, making decisions with your gut. I've always thought there's three ways to make decisions in business: with your head, your heart, your gut. Hopefully 90% of the time, those decisions are made with your head. You know, those, when you're making decisions with your heart or your gut, there's always room for error. So I really thought that was insightful. What are some of your prospective clients that you're able to help the most? Yeah. So we work with all different kinds of organizations around the country. And in fact, we've, we've got international clients as well. And, and some are big and some are small. Most of the work that I'm um, selling Outbound, the people I'm really talking to is agencies, right? Because for me, um, what's really valuable is when organizations have somebody on board that they're working with that knows how to work with information like this and do a good job with it. And sometimes organizations want this information, but then they don't know what to do with it. So it doesn't get used, right? My, my personal preference is if we're all going to invest so much in this in terms of time and stuff like that, let's, let's make sure it's worth doing for you, right? So that, you, you, you know... You get something out of it. And I like working with agencies because invariably when I show this data to agencies, man, you could just see, you could just see the fire light. Like they know what to do with this information and it drives incredibly creative ideas from them and stuff that they can execute on behalf of a client. But so, you know, my typical prospect is are, are, are small to mid-sized agencies who really want to stand out with respect to the competition they're up against. Um, be able to really support their recommendations with strong data, and as a result, have a much better hit rate on what's working for their clients, right, than maybe the competitions that's just kind of throwing stuff at the wall and hoping, so um, it's not like the old days, man. Your client's looking at the same dashboard you are, so if you're, not, if you're not moving the needle, it's a problem for an agency. And so, you know, my goal is really to sort of solve that. How can, how can smaller agencies really have something to stand on and know that the work that they're doing is much more likely to have an impact in a way that the client is going to appreciate and, and, and stick around. And I imagine when you, when, you, when you deliver the report and you have your debrief meeting with them, you know, when the light bulb goes off, I'm sure it's either a super creative mind saying, oh my gosh, we can do all of this stuff with this data. Or you ha- conversely, you have somebody there saying, oh my God, we've been going down such the wrong road in the past. Now we have... A- now we have a roadmap to, to, to towards success. Yeah. I mean, I, I, inevitably, um, some clients see things that are discouraging to them, right? An initiative that mm-hmm. or, or, or brand positioning that's super exciting to them or very deeply held has no resonance with the audiences that, that they really want, right? Or something that they think is really positive about themselves is falling, is falling flat. Um, I have very few clients who have the luxury of being able to do this kind of work before they do anything in the marketplace, right? Who are like, okay, we're going to get this right before we go out. Nobody has that, right? Everybody is trying to change the tires while they are driving. Absolutely. Um, Something is broken. And Yeah. And, and honestly, much of the work I do doesn't, it's not as much resulting in sort of wholesale, let's do a 180 for this brand or this organization as it is, okay, now we understand a little better why this is happening or that is happening and how to refine this messaging. Um, I always tell clients, like, you know, one of the most helpful things you're going to understand out of, of research like this is what, is what appeals to everybody, virtually anybody in your target audience that you would talk to. Like, what do they, would they all love to hear about and, and would they find compelling? 
What does nobody care about? So you should just stop talking about altogether because it's not resonant to anyone, right? And I have seen examples of that. Um, and then we I've been are. guilty of that. I, and I've been guilty of that. Pushing out messages, yeah. pushing out messages that resonate with me and, and, and Kevin and then Doesn't saying, matter at all. Right. Wow, well, these resonate with me and Kevin right, as the business right. owner. We all have that problem, right? We're all clients. super steeped yeah. in what we do, and we're really proud of it, and we're excited about it, and we want to go out. But sometimes we're saying things that just don't, that just aren't relevant to the people that we're trying to sell to. And then you're going to find things that are really important to certain people and not to other people. And that's where, that's where the talent of an agency or a really strong marketing arm can say, look, we need to stop talking to everybody the same damn way because they're not all the same. Like we really need to focus on this for these people and this for other people, because honestly, the more stuff you drag people through that they don't care about, the less enamored they are going to be with you, the less patient they're gonna be about checking out the stuff on the website. I mean, you guys, are, you guys are site builders. You know how bad it is if it takes them a long time to find what they want. So you gotta, you gotta clear the way as much as you can. Yeah, and it's a fine line to balance, you know? Yeah, it is. You know, being able to speak to everyone while still kind of massaging the people who really care. What are three simple tips that you would give somebody listening in our yeah. audience who might not have the ability to hire somebody to put together the segmentation? What you know, if they wanted to go tackle this themselves, three simple tips. Okay. All right. Here's the first one. You ready for this? People hate this. When I do this in workshops, they hate this. Try to define your ideal customers without using any demographic characteristics at all. Try it. Like, go ahead. Like, you try it, Kevin. Go ahead. Like, your customers, for your ideal customers for, for Trinity, like, if you, if you couldn't describe them using any sort of business demographics or personal demographics, how, how would you describe them? All right. So, business owners who don't have time. To mm -hmm. do their marketing themselves. Mm -hmm. Good. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> it's, business it's hard, right? Like it's hard. Uh, so maybe, and you know what? I go business owners who don't care to do there it. They don't go. want to use yeah. social media right, right now. Exactly. So that that's the biggest problem. Yeah. So the first thing I tell people is force yourself. It doesn't mean that demographics won't matter to you as you finalize your audience. You may want to, like I, you know, I like working with agencies of a particular size. That's my choice, right? But what happens when we start defining our audiences demographically, what happens is that we stop there because we think we're done. We're like, oh yeah, we've got young women, we've got middle-aged women, and we've got older women. Bam, I'm good, I'm done, now I can move on. But that doesn't tell you anything about these people. So I, what I find is that Demographics are a crutch. So I make people try to think about what's going on with their audiences without any of those considerations. And you did a good job, right? Because you went right to my recommendation number two, okay? Okay. So I, Greg and I have had this conversation before where I, 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 talked, about, I talked about demographics and Greg kind of gave me a little bit of pushback, so I have been asked those questions before. It did take me a it did take me a minute to remember the answer, but before before we get to but before we get to your point too, that's only because I've worked with Susan for about ten years, <laughs> and she's rubbed off on me in more ways than one. So. I've been beating this exactly. Interview. Yeah, exactly. Chris Lee is the same way. You guys had him on, and man, yeah, he's 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 sick of hearing me talk too. So um, so number one. Like, do this without demographics. Number two, you need to think about the problem that you are solving, okay? Because, and I'm like this, we're all like this, right? We've built these businesses and we're super excited about what we're doing. And if you go on the web, 98% of the websites out there are like, here's what I have. And here's the flavors and the sizes and how much it costs and how you could get it. And here's all the amazing technical things behind it, right? We are. Second big tip is stop thinking about the problem being that they don't have what you're selling. That is not the problem, okay? And, you know, Chris Lee, he hates when I tell this story. But years ago, when we started working together and I started dragging him through this process. And, you know, Chris is a CRM guy. You guys talked to him. He's, you know, super smart, like really talented guy. And I was like, what problem do they have? that you are solving. And he goes, well, they don't have a CRM. And I'm like, that is not their problem. That is your problem. That is not their problem. Their problem 
right, is I can never get my hands on my prospect's contact information when I need it. I have no, I have no way for following up with people who have asked me something and then never followed through with a purchase, right? Like I, those are, those are problems. Those are, we need to think about the problems that we are solving as organizations, not from our perspective, but from the perspectives of the people that have them. And, and they, they, they're not always the same problem, right? You can, you can be solving multiple problems for folks. I, I mean, um, Greg knows this story. I had a client who, um, they do like scented um, home fragrance products, right? Like, so potpourri, and scented candles and all that kind of stuff. And they have, prob they have people who, as they expected, right, are super like fragrance oriented. And I just want to come into my house and have it be the environment that like makes me feel a particular way. I don't give a damn what anybody else thinks. Like this is my bathroom and this is what I want it to be like, okay? Those people are buying these products. But they also have people who are like, I want people who visit my home to be like, oh my God, this place is incredible. You are like Martha Stewart. Your home looks incredible. And all the colors and the scents and what an incredible, you know, they're doing it for a completely different reason. They are solving a completely different problem than the first group. They're buying the same product. But this company was thinking of itself as a home fragrance company, as like a fragrance company. And, and for some of these people, they're a decorating. They're a decor company, right? Or they're a like, I need a gift solution or whatever so almost life right so so we need to think about the problems that we are really solving for people from their perspective not ours and the nice thing about focusing on the problem you want to solve as an organization is that it opens up a huge range of possibilities of what the hell you could do for people because because you're not solving and you guys do this really well right like you're not about like the problem being i need a website that's not the problem that you guys want to sell. And there are lots of folks out there that could solve that problem. Business is having, and how can we, given all of the tools that we know how to work with, help solve that problem? And so it opens up possibilities for you guys in terms of how you're actually helping beyond just we could build you a WordPress website, right? That'll cost you X amount. Um, so I think that's. Do you think, can I, can yeah. I ask a quick question here? Do you, you know, that's exactly how we run our business. And I, I always say, I don't think people care right. how we build the site so much as whether or not we can solve the problem. You agree with that? Well, I think there are probably some people that really care how you build the site. Mm -hmm. The question you guys have to decide is, are those the people you want? Right. Right? Like, gotcha. you know, so it, what, what are the problems that you want to solve? That people have. You don't have to solve every problem out there. So my girlfriend, Suzanne Lewis, super brilliant, and she is a college coach. She works with parents and students on, on finding a college. The problem Suzanne wants to solve is I need to find the right college. Like I need to find the place that's for me, that I'm going to feel great in, that's going to support my strengths and my weaknesses and, and really give me what I'm looking to get out of college, right? Awesome. The problem Suzanne does not want to solve is I need to get my kid into Harvard. Now, there's plenty of people that have that problem, but Suzanne does not want to solve that problem. That is not what she is out there to do, is to get your kid into Harvard or Yale, right? So she has content on her website that specifically talks about how that's not what she's here to do. And if that's what you want, she's not your gal. You know? So I think that... To your point, Greg, there are definitely going to be people who want specific things that you could deliver on, right? You guys know, really know what you're doing. So if somebody wants to dig deep into the weeds about the technical aspects of building a great website, you could do that. The question is, given where your business wants to go and the problems you want to solve, is that a client you want? Sometimes there are clients we could get that honestly are more trouble than they're worth because it's not exactly what we're passionate about doing. So I think, that's, I think that's step two, right? So number one, try to do this without demographics, at least initially if you can. Step two, figure out the problems that people really have that you want to be solving, okay? And the third piece of advice I would give is you've got to think about why they haven't solved the problem already. Because this is the key to your differentiation, right? This helps you figure out where you need to be what you need to be saying, who they are going to compare you to. So it's all well and good to have a problem. Why haven't you solved it? How many web shops are there out there? 
right? Lacking that they have not been able to resolve, that you can. Now, if somebody's problem is that they can't find somebody to build them a website for $300, that may not be the problem you want to solve, right? But if, if, if the problem is, look, I, I don't know that much about websites. I just got to fix this business problem. I can't get enough customers. I can't, I need to have an easy way for people to buy my products online, right? So that I don't have to staff as, the same way or like whatever it is, that's a problem that you guys specifically would like to solve. And you can probably sitting here right now, if you think about the kinds of customers you want, the problems that they've struggled with and why they haven't solved them, that last question is also defining for you as to which of these folks you want and which they aren't, you know, which aren't, right? Because that's, a, that, that's amazing. That's just amazing. I think that uh, my eyes have lit up with a bunch oh, of God. ideas. <laughs> some, some stuff for Ke- that Kevin it's and I need to, to years handle. Also. Later. You can move away, but you cannot escape me, Greg. That's right. That's right. And for those of you who don't know, that don't know, Susan and I used to share some office space in uh, at Gangplank HQ down in Chandler, Arizona. Old when I, when I'm old school. Old school. I, you know what's funny is like the, the more yeah. episodes we get in, the more we talk about Gangplank. I don't think one episode so yeah. like one episode has gone by we have not mentioned Gangplank. Yeah, it was that instrumental in my yep. my life and Susan and you know, Susan's and Chris Lee and all the other knuckleheads that we throw their names out there once they're in a job. That was like a magical moment. I think of it like Cheers, right? <laughs> like the place where everybody knows your name. Like there's this, and I was, I, I, um, I saw my friend Michael Barber, who you know very well, yeah, Greg, sure. um, in, in Phoenix, who was here for, uh, for a conference. And we talked about that, right? Like that yeah. sort of magical time and space where just a lot of really smart and community oriented people with a shared philosophy sort of really um, got off the ground in, in a lot of ways. So that was good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's let's. I appreciate all your insight on audience segmentation, and I hope it definitely helps our audience here. Uh-oh. Let's change the topic here a little bit, and let's. I want to take a moment. <clears throat> Trinity Web Media. We have our own okay. community initiative called Trinity Cares. So we're gonna we're putting a page up there. It's uh, trinitywebmedia.com slash bonus dash kids. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I want you to talk a little bit about your GoFundMe campaign and what you're doing with your personal community with your bonus kids, as you like to call them. Kids. um, Andrew's 22 and Juno is going to be 18 here in April, which is frightening. I know. It's crazy. Um, But um, so um, Juno in particular, but both of the kids... um, you know, they have friends, they have other kids that they hang out with or whatever. And what we have seen as parents that I never expected over the course, Juno in particular, but both of the kids, um, you know, they have friends, they have other kids that they hang out with or whatever. And what we have seen as parents that I never expected over the course of the last few years is kids who just, man, they end up in a rough place. You know, I, I used to think that being a little kid was hard, right? And that's when you really needed help. And what I've come to believe is that while that that is certainly true, there is this age, like high school, getting out of high school into early adulthood, where there are a lot of kids who are just trying to figure it out on their own and have very little support or resources in order to do that. They got a bad family situation. Um, You know, my kid's gay and and we know a lot of kids who have come out to families and been booted out. You know, stuff's on the lawn. Forget it. You, You know, you're not here anymore. Or, or just more simply have lost a major, you know, lost dad or something like that. And so the family financial situation falls apart. And so um, we, over the course of the last, I don't know, six months or so or whatever, we basically collected this motley crew of kids. They all, they range in age from like 19 to 22. Um, there's four of them, in addition to my two kids who live with us and are really, you know, we're just giving them space to like, get ready for their next big thing. They're all really bright kids. They're all terrific, terrific kids. And for whatever reason, you know, they are sleeping in a car or they don't have a place to go. Um, and so they're staying here with us. It's, it's a full house. We've got a couple of them in the tent out back. It's fine. It's Arizona in the winter, so that's all good. Um, and, you know, I'm happy, yeah, I'm happy to this see tent, and, and this tent, I saw pictures of this tent. This is not a tent like Kevin, you and I slept in like when we were in Joshua Tree. This is a little bit. No, no. No, I, 
Yeah, I am told that the, the the term for this tent is bougie. That's what I'm told. This is a bougie tent. We got there's rug in there. There's like chandeliers and lights and you know all that kind of stuff. Um, and so you know, I don't know. I guess about a month or so ago, I just um, you know we're doing everything we can for these kids, but they need more help than we can give them. And so I started a GoFundMe for to just help our bonus kids move out. Right? They all they want to get an apartment together, but. Um, you know, I was just looking for a grand to help him like deal with first and last month's rent maybe and just kind of give a leg up. Well, we had an incredible response to that GoFundMe campaign. We've raised $8,000 already um, for these kids. We've been able to help them. Um, you know, it's so complex the things you have to worry about, right? Like you have to have credit. If you want to, a lot of times even now, like get a job or rent a house or whatever, they're checking that, right? Well, if you haven't had anything but part-time retail jobs, you don't have that. You don't have credit. Make your car payments. Your credit's suffering. So we're helping them just sort of lay good groundwork. We're doing a lot of talk about budgeting. We're doing all that kind of stuff. And then the other thing we're doing is just being a big, messy family. Like we had dinner last night. We had, you know, 10 people around the table. Um, in the last week, two of the kids have started full-time jobs and another one's gotten a job offer that they're going to start next week. So lots to celebrate. And a lot of these kids have never been in a situation where they have been celebrated, you know, for the stuff that they're doing and for how awesome they are. So um, it's a, you know, it's, for me, it's a labor of love. They're just amazing kids. And I, I am so privileged to be witness to what they are creating in their own lives, despite the most difficult circumstances that you can imagine, and certainly far more than I ever had to deal with as a kid. So, so that's the bonus kid story. And, and, you know, when I'm not working on the business, I'm, there's something crazy going on around here, that's for sure. Your mom and the bonus kids. <clears throat> yeah, I'm mom and the bonus kids. Or, or mom and this bonus kid in San Diego from time to time, maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like that so, rule. It's all good. Everybody needs absolutely. a mom. Absolutely. So we'll put a link, we're going to put a link to our page on the Trinity site, which is going to link out to your GoFundMe oh, in the show notes here. Thank you so no much. Problem. Oh, that's you really know, fun of you guys. I really oh, appreciate anytime. that. So let's wrap up the show. I'm going to ask you, let's do five quick rapid questions. Oh, God. Um, okay. They're going to, the topics are going to range. So are you All ready right. for it? I'm ready. Okay. Favorite, favorite brew pub, Santana or Four Peaks? Oh, are those my two options? Yeah. yeah. I'm only giving you two four, options. Four Peaks. Because I know you. Four Peaks. Four Peaks? Yeah. I, yep. I agree. What's your favorite conference for marketing? Favorite marketing Ooh. conference you go to? Ooh, that's an interesting one. Um, so we're talking about conferences that you can still go to. Yes. Yeah. Or, or, or anyone that people should be on the yeah. lookout for. Um, well, I'll tell you, I, I really like Marketing United, um, which is put on by Emma, the email company. I'm speaking in Nashville this year for Marketing mm -hmm. United. Um, I just like their perspective about things. I, you know, I, I speak at a lot of conferences and they all have their values. Some are super overwhelming for folks. I'm kind of an introvert, so I get kind of, you know, I can get kind of tapped out on conferences. I think the thing about conferences is you just have to know what, what, what you want out of them. You know, um, it, there's a lot of great conferences yeah. out there and you just have to sort of think about what you're trying to look for. But I, I guess I would say marketing. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I saw you were at Digital Summit yesterday or this week with, and Michael Barber was speaking there, our, our good friend, Michael Barber. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. And that was good. I really, I mean, I really liked, I really liked that too. So I'm going to be doing some more of those, uh, some more of those as a, as an attendee. Cause I think they had good quality folks in there. And he's a smart, he's such a smart dude that we're going to try to get him on the show in, in a couple episodes for sure. So, <clears throat> so, okay. Next question. What's a better football team, the Philadelphia Eagles or the New York Giants? Oh, man. Seriously? <laughs> I know. Mind you, I'm asking a Washington Redskins uh, I'm fan. I'm not even a Redskins fan. Anymore. <laughs> football just disgusts me now anymore. I don't know. You know what? I'm usually, I'm usually going to vote for the underdog. So it depends on the matchup, but I'm going to go for the underdog or anybody but Dallas. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Spoken like a true NFC yeah, fan. Yeah. I love it. And then here's the last question. What's one takeaway you want somebody to, to, they can walk away from this episode with? What I want everybody to realize is that there is an audience for them. So many of us worry about how we stack up against the other competition. And there is an audience for you based on the problem you want to solve and how you solve it and why that makes you different than everybody else. And I think that we need to stop thinking, we need to stop thinking about what, my minuscule percentage of potential customers in the United States we're going to get 
and start thinking about how many of the people that are really our ideal customers we really need to pull this off. And it's not as many maybe as you might think. So don't get discouraged, but you got to find what makes your business different. And for somebody out there, I guarantee if you can show them that, they're going to say, where have you been in my life? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time, Susan. I, I can't, uh, you know, I can't express how much I've learned today and, and just how fantastic, you know, I, and, and how much how fantastic I think you are. And, oh, thanks, and, my you know, friend. And your family I, and everybody. I love talking about this stuff. And, you know, it's always awesome talking to you guys. I'm so proud of what you're doing. And, man, it's been a journey, right? It's a journey for all of us. It's a journey. You know, not the not the, I remember a long time ago, probably about ten years ago, when I was first starting yes. out. Susan and I were having cocktails at the roof of what then became my yep. office at Studio Five Hundred Two, yep. and she told me, and I was riding that roller coaster up and down, and she just told me, and it, it sticks with me to the day. She said, "Just fight right. the good fight," and I think that that is is so important when we're trying to build businesses and we're trying to be pop problem solvers in a world of yep. people selling solutions. The problem solvers just have to keep fighting the good fight. So thank you so much for your time, Susan. And you can catch Susan at Susan Beyer on Twitter and then also audienceaudit.com. It was great having you. Thank you so much, Susan. Yep. Thanks, you guys. This was super fun. Loved it. Right. Hey, everyone. Thank you for listening to The New Marketing Show with our special guest, Susan Beyer. Hey, if you like what you hear, please subscribe to us, rate, review on iTunes, and you can catch us at trinitywebmedia.com slash iTunes. See you next time.